Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch. Welcome today to my review of the Oleg and Vice P101. I'm enjoying making these little threads, little connections between consecutive reviews at the moment. And indeed, today's review is linked to the last video that I uploaded, the Smith's Everest PRS25. I mentioned in the intro to that video, I think one of the more pleasant feel-good elements about the resurgence of interest in mechanical watches is the re-emergence, the reanimation in some cases of brands that had long since died or were certainly on their way to horological obscurity. Smith's is a good example. They ceased production in the 70s, but a new company bought the name and has now resurrected some of their older models. Squally, TUW, Rula, Vertex, there are many, many more examples of dead brands suddenly rising from the ashes. Oleg and Vice is another good example. Perhaps you've heard of O&W, perhaps you haven't. They were founded in the 1950s in Switzerland, had a kind of golden period in the 60s and 70s, very popular on the wrists of American GIs during the Vietnam War. If they weren't wearing Seikos, they may well have been wearing O&Ws, but the brand began to drift, the quartz crisis, etc., etc. Now, they were continuously making watches, and it was one of their distributors that bought the company from Mr. Vice in 2016-2017. So perhaps not entirely dead, there is a continuous thread, more a rebirth with new ideas, new capital, but retaining the brand name of old. Now, to be clear, this one was sent to me for free by the company. I don't have to send it back. It's a great watch. I've had this one in Sydney for a number of months now and it has become my daily. Now, it's a great watch to be sent for free. I appreciate and I have to remain objective during this review and any other review when I'm given free product by a company. That's one of the challenges I face as a watch reviewer. So I'm gonna tell you why I really enjoy this watch. I think this one's a little bit special and if the company keep doing what they're doing, they are pretty much guaranteed success. Then I'm gonna tell you why I think they have shot themselves in the foot big time with one particular element of the watch. Let's flip the camera and get on with it. Now I will obviously leave a link to the O&W website in the description of the video and I urge you to check it out. Not only is it a beautiful website, it is really rather stylish, but I think it gives you a good idea of where the company has come from and where the company is likely to go in the future. Lovely current lineup. It looks like one case fits all, but there's a diver's watch, there's a couple of pilot's watches in there, all using the basic same case structure. Very nice, consistent design aesthetic across all those watches as well. There's also images of the O&W back catalog. One reason for buying an existing company with such a rich history is so that you can plunder their back catalogue for inspiration. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that in the years to come. I think there's also a real focus on quality evident here that comes across in the watch. Now, we all know that Swiss made is a bit slippery. It just means that 60% of the money has to be Swiss and it has to be cased in Switzerland. O&W watches are 90% Swiss made. They tell you exactly where each individual component of the watch comes from down to the leather tag on the package. A lot of it's handmade, a lot of it's hand finished. Now, I may be the self-appointed budget guy on YouTube, but in between the Casios, I've reviewed dozens of Rolex, Omega, Breitling, Tag, and Oris, and I have to say the quality on offer in this O&W for just over a thousand US dollars stands up very, very well indeed against the big heavy hitting Swiss competition. Now the small cardboard box made out of Italian paper with indeed a British leather tag on there isn't gonna win any awards at a grand, but I guess that money has been spent on the watch. And in this case, it actually has been spent on the watch. Three year warranty, also very nice to see at the price. So it's almost like a two for the price of one deal here. It's a pilot's watch. This is a bi-directional friction bezel allowing you to track a second time zone. I think one of the big appeals for me is that I have been able to track a second time zone very simply and easily. GMT there, if it's 10 o'clock here, it's just after one in sunny London. And yet it has a screw down crown, screw down case back and 300 meters of water resistance. There is a P104 which has a slide rule bezel and a much more complicated look for it but I asked specifically for this P101 because I think it's a nice, clean looking watch. 39 and a half millimeters in diameter. 
12.3 mil thick. Now, baby got lugs, 50 mil of lugs to be precise. So it is quite a, a long watch and it does wear a little bit larger than that diameter would suggest. I guess that's gonna give guys with smaller wrists than mine a bit of difficulty, but I have had no problems with this one drilled lug. There's actually a couple of different holes for spring bars in here. Again, I'll talk about that later. It's useful if you wanna pop it on leather straps or NATOs. 20 millimeter lug width, tapering down to about 18, back up to 20 at the clasp and size up for me, seven inch wrist. This one weighs in bang on that sweet spot at 154 grams. 316L stainless steel case crown, solid case back. It's a solid link bracelet with solid end links and screw links. The bracelet is absolutely exquisite. I'll talk about that a bit later on. And the finishing on the case is really good, I think. All brush, no polished surfaces anywhere on this watch, and it's brushed to perfection. Super, super smooth on the uppers on the edges of the mid case and on the tops of that bracelet on those outer links of the bracelet as well. Unguarded crown vintage style with the O&W logo, nice and easy to grip and that kind of DLC black finish on the bezel coin edge there, nice and easy to grip as well. Dead flat piece of boxed sapphire with anti-reflective undercoating. And the bracelet is outstanding, definitely one of the nicest bracelets that I've come across on any watch really, and especially around this thousand dollar price tag. They call this one uh, Beads of Rice. It's kind of halfway between a Beads of Rice and a Jubilee, beautiful individual links. These are all machined from a solid piece of 316L stainless steel, they're hand brushed, all assembled by hand to ensure that there, there's no stretching or limited chance of this one stretching with use. Zero movement there from the end link. The whole watch feels beautifully put together, rock solid, and as I said, there's screw links as well. Solid screw down stainless steel case back with the usual spec sheet, 300 meters water resistance, and then they remind you that it's a pilot's watch because it's got 300 meters of water resistance. Stainless steel Swiss made, and the O and W propeller style logo in the middle there, Zurich 1956. Now it is a bit of a shame that that is a solid case back because there is an ETA 282042 behind it that has had a bit of work done by O and W. So much so that I'm gonna pop the case back off of this one, something I don't normally do in a review and I'll show you it a bit later, but let's get it on the time grapher first because it has also been regulated. Indeed, it has been regulated. That's the kind of set of figures that you wanna see from a daily driver. Plus two, plus three seconds per day, very healthy amplitude, minimal beat error. Now, if I take the case back off, I can show you the custom rotor and main plate engraving. Now, a lot of companies buy an off-the-shelf movement from ETA or Solita, and they will have their name etched into the standard rotor. I've seen that on many occasions. Far fewer go to the extent of replacing the rotor with one of their own design. Oris do this, for example, they put that big red rotor on a Solita 200. O and W, as you can see here, have custom designed a rotor of their own for the ETA 2824. I've never seen a brand at this price point take off the shelf movement and engrave their name onto the main plate. Especially surprising given that this has a solid case back. So it's a kind of hidden detail. I think another example of O and W really just kind of pushing the boundaries of what you can expect for this price. And I think it is a pretty but functional dial design here as well. They've taken some elements from their back catalog, but they haven't just poached an old design and modernized it. So legibility obviously key for a pilot's watch. You've got a good size handset here, I think nicely in proportion. Those big indexes at 12, three and nine, and the truncated one down there at six are all applied. Everything else is just printed on. There's a kind of rough brush to the hands and to all of those indexes. I'll throw some macro in here as well. You can see what I mean about that. Nice choice with the date wheel moving it down there at six o'clock. And there's a kind of color match date wheel. At least it's a black date wheel where there's a, a matte gray dial finish to this watch. O&W Zurich 1956 printed in white underneath the baton at 12, automatic 300 meters, and then Swiss made printed just beneath the index at six. Now this watch has appeared on the channel before. It featured in Lumor's episode four. A bit like bringing a knife to a gunfight though, it went up against a whole bunch of dive watches. The Luma, I have to say though, is pretty good. Super Luma Nova on the hands and on those four major indices. Anecdotally, I've been wearing this watch quite a lot and you still get a, a nice clean read on it five, six hours after I turn off the lights. 
All right, all right, Jody. Enough gushing praise. You said this was going to be an objective review. What's your problem with this one? Well, what have I not shown you to this point? I have waxed lyrical about that fantastic bracelet, but I have not shown you the clasp as yet. I remember when this watch first arrived in Sydney, I brought it home from the post office and I excitedly unpackaged it in my kitchen counter and I swear I let out a cry like Darth Vader from Revenge of the Sith when I saw the cheap pressed clasp. Such a lovely watch. One of the best bracelets I've seen on a watch at this price. Why did they put this cheap press clasp on it? Not only is it pressed, but it's not even a good one. It's etched with the brand logo and it's got security pushers, but it's only got two levels of micro adjust. Now these are big, chunky links here. That means you're pretty much forced to wear this one looser than you might otherwise like to. And it's not even all that secure. Listen to this. You think you've popped it, but you haven't. You've got to really double close it. You've got to give it a very firm push beyond the audible click before it actually secures. I've had it pop off on a number of occasions when I've forgotten to give it a proper press. Now, if you're a regular on the channel, you'll be well aware that I bang on about clasps quite a bit. It seems to be a Friday afternoon at 4.30 job with a lot of companies. They spend so much time making a beautiful watch and then kind of forget to finish it off with a good clasp, an appropriate clasp for the watch overall. And really, it can be an Achilles heel if it's not done properly. People often leave me a comment and they say, hey, Jody, Rolex was making press clasps up till not that long ago. And indeed they were. Here is Mr. X's Rolex Explorer from the early 2000s with a press clasp, but it's got a proper security fold over and five levels of micro adjust. And here's some footage of the clasp on a current model Rolex Explorer 214270. I often counter that argument by saying, yes, and Rolls Royce used to fit carburetors to their engines, but they don't do that anymore because the market and technology have both moved beyond that. So the clasp on this one has clearly been a bit of a letdown for me personally. It really is the only fly in the ointment for otherwise what I think is a fabulously well-made and very well-priced watch from a brand with a rich history and heritage behind it. Now, I did actually have a phone conversation with Charles, the owner of o and and probably he was rolling his eyes in the background at some snotty YouTube reviewer criticising his clasp. He said that his customers hadn't had a problem with it to this point. It had been noted that you couldn't get a really good fit though, and they were going to be issuing new bottles with half links. So I guess there is a workaround in prospect, but I don't think it's the right workaround. I think they should rework this clasp and make it a proper machine clasp at the same time. Okay, okay, moving on to some wrist shots because it is a great looking watch, I think. Long lug to lug at 50, you can see here, I've got a seven inch wrist. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for people whose wrist sizes are much smaller than mine. You're probably gonna get a bit of kind of extension there. It's probably gonna be sticking out too far. But as it is, I do have to wear it loose because of the lack of micro adjust here. But 150 grams, it's not too bad overall. And it looks stunning. I mean, again, that bracelet is just a cracker. And that's the proper overhead shot. No problems with legibility, which is good for a diver's watch and a pilot's watch. And I guess this one can fulfill both roles if you want it to. I love that kind of vintage style look, the slightly off color hands, indices and bezel numerals. I don't think it's overdone. It doesn't look like Fortina, but it does add another interesting visual element to the watch. Outside, plenty of anti-reflective coating on the underside of that box sapphire crystal. Again, no problems with legibility, even in strong sunlight with this one I found. I've been to the beach with this one. We've had a, a merry old time of it in Sydney over the last few months, the P101 and I. On wrist, there is a bit of curvature to the case, as you can see here. Those lugs do point downwards, but it is quite long lug to lug. If this is gonna be an issue for you, you can always try it on a leather strap or a NATO, and I believe they've got some rubber straps in the pipe. Line. Indeed, if you're not a bracelet guy, you can save yourself about $150 and opt for the same watch on this very soft and comfortable Italian made leather strap, nice matching brushed hardware, OWZ, so Oleg and Weiss Zurich 1956 on the underside. And as a military style watch, I think it looks pretty good on a NATO. Here is a grey one by Moose Straps. 
complementing the grey colour on the dial. Mentioned earlier on, two different sets of spring bar holes here. You've got a kind of outer one for NATOs and an inner one for leather strap to minimise the gap between the, the case and your strap or add a bit of extra space if you've got a big, thick, heavy nylon or seat belt style NATO to slot through it. So in spite of my endless carping on about the clasp, I have forgiven this O and WP101, and indeed it has become my daily. It is just such a quality item, beautifully finished, fabulous bracelet. I love the little touches on the main plate. I love the look of the dial, and I love being able to track a second time zone quickly and easily. It's probably a more useful feature for that bezel than a rotating dive time style stuff for me anyway. Like I said, a really interesting brand. They're only just coming back to life after the purchase in 2017. I think they've already got a fairly strong range of watches in their stable and I'm excited to see what they do in future and I'll be even more excited if they replace the clasp. So there you have it, the ONW P101. It really is a little bit special, I think. The focus on Swiss made, handmade, hand assembled, beautiful finishing, two watches in one. You get a diver and a pilot's watch, track two time zones, engraving on the main plate, custom rotor, and one of the most beautiful, best manufactured bracelets that I've seen on any watch at any price, with one of the cheapest and most useless clasps that I've seen on any watch at any price. A relatively easy fix for the company though, and I dearly hope that they do that at some point over the next while, because I've seen that class mentioned as a complaint in other reviews of the brand. But there is so much potential for this rebirth, this re-emergence of O&W. Lovely design aesthetic across their current range of watches and a fabulous back catalogue to raid for inspiration. Should be interesting to see where they go from here. Thanks for watching, I will see you in a future video.